Hello, today I'll be taking a look at the Sun Ultra 5 on Sunday. Sunday is going to be a little mini-series I'm going to do about my Sun collection. The Ultra 5 and Ultra 10 are directly related, and their code name is Darwin. They were the first Sun workstations to adopt a significant number of industry-standard commodity parts in an effort to bring down costs. Prior to the Ultra 5 and Ultra 10, Sun had a widening gap between their 32-bit S-Bus workstations and their high-end 64-bit S-Bus workstations. The 32-bit machines were no longer competitive at that point, and they quickly needed something that could be sold at the same price point as a standard Wintel box. The Ultra 5 and Ultra 10 brought UltraSpark down to that entry-level space, giving you a 64-bit system at 32-bit price points. While it isn't the fastest system due to a lackluster IDE implementation, these boxes make great first-time SunSpark systems for a hobbyist, mainly due to ease of repair and operating system flexibility. Here are the specs of my Ultra 5. It has the entry-level 270MHz UltraSpark 2i, which is a 256K L2 cache and a 32K L1 cache, 256 meg of ECC memory, 4 gig IDE hard drive, ATI RAGE in an 8-bit mode. It does not support 24-bit because this is the revision 1 motherboard with only 2 meg of VRAM instead of the needed 4. 100 megabit LAN, and a Sun PCI option, which is a PC on a card that I'll cover in a separate video. Let's just quickly take a look at the I.O. on the back of the system. So you get three PCI expansion card slots, PCI 1, PCI 3, and PCI 2. In the second slot, I have a Raptor video card. And in the first two slots here, we have our Sun PCI. It takes up two slots. And here's the serial and parallel header off of the motherboard, the onboard video, onboard ethernet. And then down here you have your audio connections and a Sun keyboard. Since we're installing Solaris 2.6, I have to swap out the hard drive because Solaris 2.6 only supports up to eight gig hard drives in these systems. Uh, that was fixed in Solaris 8. It's a software issue, not so much a hardware issue on these boxes. And there's my 80 gig hard drive I used to test Solaris 8 in it. I'm gonna pull that out and I'm gonna put in the, a much smaller four gig drive. <laughs> These are still great first-time Sun systems because they're so standard. There's nothing weird about them. They're easy to learn. Uh, they're easy to work with. They're easy to repair. I mean, they're, they're great. And you get a wide range of operating systems to play with. Uh, the open source support is really quite good on the BSD side of the fence. <laughs> system and we're going to set it up from scratch we're here at open boot prompt and it's waiting for us to tell it to do something so one thing i'd like to go over first is the fact that you can actually overclock these systems it's a little bit unique because it's actually done entirely in software there's no jumpers you have to set so it's a completely hidden option in open boot obviously because they don't want people mucking with this so you type in also hidden and you get an OK prompt, and then you type in D pound space, the clock speed you'd like to run at. So this is 270 megahertz, let's bump it up to 290. You don't need any megahertz afterwards. And then at speed, you get an OK. And then you do NV edit. If you want to make it permanent, The UltraSpark 2i is actually fairly overclockable. It runs fairly cool. And uh, the lower clocked chips, I suspect, were binned from higher clock chips, and there's always a chance that uh, you might have won the Silicon Lottery. So let's go ahead and set that. And then you hit Control C to break out. And then you do NV Store to store that to NV RAM. And now we're gonna do set nv use nv ram for call question mark true what that'll do is it'll run that on every boot and we're gonna do a set all Whoop, i cannot type today and now the system will boot up at 290 megahertz 
And there you go. You can see the system is booted at 290. That'll give us a nice little performance jump, actually. So time to boot to Solaris. Yes, we actually have boxed real Solaris, version 2.6, 398. So now we're ready to install Solaris 2.6. Push stop A at the open boot, type in boot, CD-ROM. The system will now boot from CD-ROM. All right, so now we're booted into the Solaris 2.6 installer. Specify your language out of the options available on the distribution. Click continue, continue again, give the system a host name. It'll be ultra original and just call it what it is. This is a network system. address continue we do not have NIS in our environment we have DNS so we're gonna do none and we'll set up DNS later once we're installed system is a part of a subnet just put in your setting mask it automatically assumes a slash 24 which is correct for my lab environment and geographic region is fine for time zone Eastern is correct it pulls the time out of the clock and you have an opportunity to correct it but this looks close enough for me to be happy. The system identification is completed. To the next phase, which is partitioning the hard drive, formatting the disk, uh, specifying which parts of Solaris 2.6 you want to install off of the CD. And then you kick back, relax, and you wait for it to install. And that could take a good minute, which is why I had prepared a cup of tea. All right, so now we are ready to begin the interactive part of the installation. We need to continue here. We're not allocating space for diskless clients. We're going to install the entire distribution, which is the entire operating system with all of the options. And it detected our hard drive. And we're going to install to that hard drive. And we're going to select our root location. It's going to be on that disk, C0, T0, D0. That's the primary IDE hard drive. Hit continue. And we're going to hit continue, we're going to do a manual layout because it's honestly terrible at doing an automatic layout. And you get this nice GUI, which just sits on top of the command line format command. So now we have an opportunity to set up NFS remote mounts, and it's really easy to do that from here because they give you a pretty nice GUI. Uh, so it's really convenient. You can do it later, modifying config files, but this is just fast. All right, so our test mount of my second mount was successful. We're gonna hit add. And now we have our mount points all configured. And it's gonna give us a summary of how the system is set up. It's an initial installation to the first IDE hard drive, the entire OS, the partition table we desired, and the NFS mounts we desired. So now we're gonna hit begin installation. So now we're just going to confirm that we need to change our default boot device. And we'll do an auto reboot. And now it is a lot of waiting as it creates the file systems and as it copies the files to the disk, it's going to be a long one. As you can see, the installer is just going to chug along copying all the files from the CD to the local hard drive. Now we need to patch the system with the minimum patch set that was provided freely by Sun via the SunSolve system. This is the 2.6 recommended set, and this brings it up to current. This does not encompass all patches. These are only critical security and bug fix patches uh, that Sun provided uh, to their entire user base. If you run this from standard user mode, you will destroy the system. You have to patch the system from single user mode. So now we're going to patch from single user mode. And first things first, I had to actually mount the opt partition because single user mode will not mount that partition by default. So now if we go to opt, you'll see our files. There's all our patches. And you just run install cluster. In 
and this is going to take a very long time to run, so you should have something else to do with your free time while this runs. Even though on a relatively fast system, this takes forever. Uh, the way it handles the verification that the patch was installed, the way it handles determining whether or not something is needed takes forever. It's a slow process. The patch has now completed. I think it's been about an hour. So now we can reboot. I6 G6 will reboot the system. I0 G0 will halt the system. Dash Y doesn't ask us yes or no, it just does it. Now that we're patched, we're gonna start installing software. So we'll start with Netscape and Communicator version 4.04. Now we're going to install the package for Netscape using package add, which is the standard Solaris package manager. Uh, first you have to put in the directory to the product directory. So I copied that. And then you put in the product name, which is this right here. And now we will install Netscape communicator on the system. So this is the same for any other pa traditionally packaged package for Solaris. It's always pkg add. And this is exactly how the command works. It's somewhat primitive in comparison to modern package management systems like yum or apt, uh, but the way it works, it works absolutely fine. Uh, it's, it's just fine, what can I say? It's not internet aware, but it's perfectly fine. It works off of file systems. So now we're going to install some modern GNU software for uh, Solaris 2.6. These have been compiled uh, by the TGC distribution. These are fantastic. It gets you a relatively recent set of user land utilities on legacy Spark. So it's, it's, it's fun stuff. Unfortunately, I haven't found a way to automate the installation of all these packages. Every time I tried to script it, I've run into issues with the pkg add command because these are not distributed as uh, folder trees, but instead uh, single PKG files. So to install these, what you have to do is PKG add dash D, and let's say I want to install Vim. I have to copy that, paste that in, and now I can install it. So that could take a while. Now if you don't want to install the whole distribution and you just want to install a handful of utilities, it's quite survivable. If you're going to install everything, well, you're going to be here for a while. But I suppose it's part of the pain. So we have some prerequisites we have to install. So we will continue with the installation. I am going to save down those prereqs. Put that here. And you're going to want to add the user TGCware uh, to your path, otherwise, you won't be able to call any of these new utilities from the command line to navigate to that folder. TGCWare distribution is included in your path. Since we're running as root, and I will eventually make myself a normal user account, I'm not going to do any permanent changes here. But you would create a dot profile file in your home directory if you were doing a permanent change that would re export the path. And you'd call the existing path 
then have a colon, and then whatever you're adding on. So now if I do an echo dollar sign path again, user tgc where dot bin is uh, listed. So I'm in the root directory. So long we have no idea about vim. If I do vim, we are now in the vim editor, which is you know more current than the ancient version of v that we're given by default. We have version 8.0 from 2016, compiled to 2018, much newer than uh, the stuff we deal with that's built into the operating system. There's a lot of nice features built into this package. So now I boot into CDE to demonstrate some web browsers, but first we have to set up networking. Yes, setup didn't actually do all the networking setup for us. So I'm specifying the default route in the Etsy default router file, which I have to create. That probably won't take hold until I reboot, so I don't want to reboot. So we're just going to run the user bin. It's actually sbin. Oops. Route add dash net zero net zero to zero to zero to zero one hundred two one sixty eight perfect now if I do a ping eight dot eight dot eight dot eight now we can ping Google so we now have IP but we don't have DNS so how do we set up DNS? Well to set up DNS we have to edit the NSS switch file we're using our new Vim. So you can see host is just files, but we also want to allow DNS. Yeah, so that's the only change you have to make. So now to get DNS working, we have to create the resolve.conf. Now we have DNS. So now, if we go, and let's say we want to visit a website, there's not a lot of websites that'll work on here, but maybe Frog Find will work. And there we go, we're on the internet with our Solaris 2.6 box. And those settings will persist after a reboot. So you can see the difference between Hot Java and Netscape, Navigator 4.04. .04. So this is a cool little website made by the guy behind the Action Retro YouTube channel. This is just neat that we have a website that renders fine in such an old browser with a little frog. So. So you can see, if you still have sites that are coded simply, a UltraSpark 2 has no issue with it whatsoever. So I hope this video was useful as like a general introduction to old Solaris and old Sunboxes. It might be long, but all these steps will get you a workable system to tinker around with, and there'll be more videos to come, namely on the Sun PCI card, where we'll have Windows and Solaris running side by side on the same box. So hope this helps you if you're new to this and you decide to pick up a sunbox. This might make your adventure slightly easier. This is kind of the 120 mile per hour getting started with Solaris 2.6 on standard hardware anyways. Can't help you much if you try to install it on something weird like, oh, I don't know, an x86 PC with the x86 distribution of Solaris that was very unloved. So, anyways, thanks for watching and good night.